Saudi Arabia has one of the most heavily censored media environments on earth. That's according to Freedom House, an advocacy group which monitors freedom in countries around the world. Censors, government-appointed editors and hugely restricted internet freedom make criticism of the government, the royal family or religious leaders and their decisions difficult or impossible. In some cases, it can lead to journalists being banned and news offices being closed down. It's a system in which sometimes people can even disappear completely. Among the missing is prominent Saudi dissident journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Senior Turkish security officials concluded that Khashoggi, who vanished after visiting the kingdom's consulate in Turkey's largest city of Istanbul, was assassinated there on orders from the highest of the Riyadh regime. An unnamed Turkish official told the New York Times that a team of Saudi agents killed the 59-year-old writer within two hours of his arrival at the consulate and then destroyed the evidence by cutting up his body. The tensions aren't new. SM Al Zamil, an economist and businessman known as a citizen journalist on social networks, was detained as was Jamal Farsi, another citizen journalist with several Saudi media platforms. Mustafa Al Hassan, a blogger and founder of the Pan Gulf Forum, which encourages civil society development, has also been detained. Others resigned or became silent due to state-sanctioned threats. Activists and journalists can easily be prosecuted under a new terrorism law, which has been heavily criticized by the United Nations and others. Why would a government take such a controlling attitude towards its media? And what are the public's views about the mysterious disappearance of a prominent journalist? Simple questions with important answers. Are the public here in Britain even aware that Saudi Arabia is ranked 168th out of 180 countries in the 2017 World Press Freedom Index? And what do they think about this? We asked them. Here's what they told us. That doesn't sound great, but then also how does the Freedom Index come about? Like what are the criteria to be on it? I'd be really interested in seeing who were lower and also who's the top? Like, I could imagine Saudi Arabia is very low on the ranking given it's an absolute monarchy and uh, operates under Sharia law. And uh, I imagine they want to keep voices, voices quiet. I think as a country that prides ourselves on democratic principles, it seems pretty poor to be uh, in supporting a country with weapons that doesn't seem to share the same principles as us. They're quite restrictive um, in terms of press freedom and I was just in Saudi recently and um, I would just try to access like random websites just to read the news and stuff was restricted so I'm not surprised. Not too surprised, no. But like maybe public opinion would have you know that this isn't the case because we're allies with them and whatnot. I did not know that exact position, but I have lived in Saudi Arabia, so I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised with the amount of persecution of journalists and political activists and sort of anyone that disagrees with the political mainstream. So I can hardly say I'm surprised. Well, I'm not really surprised that uh, they rank so badly. And the reality is that, uh, you know, it's a very oppressive um, society. People really don't have any rights whatsoever, despite that the image which uh, is sometimes created that uh, now the women have got the right of driving. The fact is that both men and women are oppressed in every other way. And, uh, you know, people are not able to criticize. There is no uh, sign of democracy. Or, um, or empowerment of people. People have got no right. Everything belongs to the royal family. And uh, uh, one friend of mine once said that uh, in Saudi Arabia, we have more members of royal family than taxi drivers. And this is, you know, there is a whole group of very much elite. And then their servants and their uh, entourage are also elite afterwards. So there's this, are a hard cold sort of system of power when it comes to ordinary citizens, they have none. Well, most of those countries that are ruled by tyrants, 
do not allow freedom of speech. There is no freedom of expression. There is no freedom of belief. You have to just accept the official version of things, whether they are news, whether they are commands, orders. Uh, so you, as a journalist, really cease to be a journalist when you work in those countries because you lose your integrity, uh, your freedom. You have to toe the line of the officials, of the, of the rulers. And in Saudi Arabia, if you speak uh, today in a tweet something against, say, the war on Yemen or in Bahrain, the same thing, three years jail. If to criticize the aggression on Yemen means three years. To criticize the regime's uh, functioning and uh, policies, again, it, it lands you in uh, uh, three or, or five years jail sentence. So we are pretty much there in a uh, quagmire of total uh, lack of freedom and liberty. The content in Saudi Arabia's domestic mass media is under the control of the government, passing through censors before being broadcast or published. While the press is said to be privately owned, each editor-in-chief of the newspapers is appointed by government. What are the public's thoughts? If every editor of something is in a position of power and influence in the government, you're not really going to get a crit a proper critique of government in the press, are you? I think it's obviously fundamentally wrong because in order to have a modern society you need to have plural opinions and citizens should be able to um, they should be able to distinguish uh, what information where information they read and how they want to evaluate it. Power is wielded through, uh, through the monarchy and then um, through bureaucratic structures beneath them. It's very structural and overbearing. Uh, if you can, if you can shut up dissent with the power of, uh, the, you know, physical coercion, people, you, you only hear one voice. You know that, um, you know, it's not going to be acceptable. Yeah, it goes against principles of free press, doesn't it? Um, for the government to have a hand, or to have too strong a hand in how, um, what the media can and can't put out. So, um, yeah, again, I feel like it's just not very similar to us. I don't see why that's a country we should have much to do with. Um, I think it. It was, I guess, in topics that maybe the Saudi government isn't necessarily wants the people to read. It ranks there with, you know, countries like Eritrea and whatnot. Um, what do I think? Obviously, you need free, free press, free media, all of that. It was my belief, certainly when I was there a few years ago, that a lot of people, whatever they were being fed by the government, they had other means of perhaps getting closer to the truth. Even here. The media isn't that free. I mean, you look at someone like Rupert Murdoch, for example, is he actually that much better than the Saudi government? He's like this massive business magnate. It really is, a, it, it's sort of a, sort of society, which is almost like a, sort of a, a, a East Germany and, a, and the way that the security and the apparatus are everything controlled. But it's not everything controlled by a structure, it's everything controlled by a royal family. And, uh, you know, the royal family appoints, and you know, even recently, the royal family is again controlled by one or two individuals. And in this case now, we are seeing the um, prince is really becoming de facto ruler and is controlling everything. And this sort of fascist, uh, sort of ideology of controlling everything, it, it becomes oppressive. And then in reality, it, it's something that, you know, the whole society cannot really run as the wishes of one uh, individual member, let alone the fact that this guy is really out of control. Look what he's doing in Yemen. Look what he's done in Syria. Look at what he's done uh, in, in Turkey. And if you sort of follow that up, you'll see that uh, his involvement in Africa, everywhere else, is extremely um, oppressive. So um, this needs to be tackled. In totalitarian regimes, there is no free mass media. Usually the uh, ali uh, uh, oligarchs, the businessmen, mostly who are linked to the regime, perhaps the princes owning uh, a publishing house, under the disguise of another businessman uh, is also part of that. So all in all, you cannot have a free press in, uh, under 
totalitarianism under dictatorship. Simply, you cannot have any kind of freedom when the ruler is dictator. You cannot have it. You cannot have any freedom under a dictator. You cannot democratize a dictator. You cannot reform a dictatorship. So whatever they say about reformation, about what, it is just a lie, a pure lie. The reality is that you either have dictatorship or democratic uh, uh, demo democratic regime or system. If you don't have it, then you will not have it under dictators. Why would a government or a ruling group need to resort to censoring media outlets, going as far as physical harm and death threats? Here's what the public here in Britain said. The media is the way the people view the government. The people view it through the eyes of the TV, of the papers, everything that comes out. So if the government has control of the media, they are able to present themselves as how they wish to be seen. So obviously a government as, a, as, a, as an actor, as a, as a power actor, wants to, wants to control um, the information that people get and essentially filtering it through media is one of the most effective ways of doing so. When a culture or a group feels under threat, they're likely to be more conservative than they were before. It doesn't really work as a rule, but I think so long as the media isn't saying negative things about the government, people are going to think less negatively, I think is the general idea. Because they want to influence what the people can think. Um, and the media usually allows people to kind of educate themselves on certain topics. So if they don't want people to be aware of those issues, they'll limit that. Because they're threatened by by masses, potentially. They want to keep a lid on things. Uh, it's very hard for me to even comprehend why that freedoms would be taken away, but also having had exposure to those kind of regimes, I'm very aware uh, that there are things that they do not want people to know, there are things they don't want people to get engaged in, um, so that's the reason, I guess. It is a very classically totalitarian way of maintaining order, just kind of quash any uprising, quash anything that speaks out against what you stand for. Well, in today's society, you can't sort of run a whole uh, uh, country based on family mafioso style and if you're going to do it you have to behave like mafia you know there's no other way uh, you are oppressing people you're taking the resources I mean Saudi Arabia is one of the richest country in the world and in region but still people are um, sort of poor in that country. Why? Not because there is not enough resources, because of this sort of level of oppression, because of the sort of the fact that uh, not the best person has been appointed in any job whatsoever on their ability. It all depends on how you are part of the royal family, yes or no, or indeed are you serving the royal family's interests, yes or no. And, power and the structure and, and uh, things is all done on those bases. You can't do that without oppressing people. You can't do that without uh, controlling everything, without actually committing acts of crime just like mafia. When the system is strong, when the, the, the foundation of the regime is powerful, it would not become afraid of criticism but if it is weak, they will think that even uh, as, as, as small as a criticism, a mild one, could blow them uh, apart. So uh, even in the West, I believe they, are, they can afford to give people some freedom because the regimes are strong. There is a functioning system uh, and each uh, power is, well, at least in theory, separate from the other. <clears throat> so. They work uh, in, uh, in synchronization to, uh, to, 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 to defend uh, the system. So someone who comes and talks, well, as, long, as long as he only talks, is not going to change the situation. But in weak uh, regimes, yeah, this is not the case. Uh, a word can cause uh, the collapse of uh, a system. According to a report by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, Saudi Arabia is America's number one weapons buyer. Between 2013 and 2017, Riyadh accounted for 18% of total U.S. arms sales. That's about $9 billion worth. 
At the same time, Reporters Without Borders claims that between September 2017 and February 2018, at least 15 journalists were imprisoned, even as America was selling arms to Saudi Arabia. A Turkish official told the New York Times on the condition of anonymity that a team of Saudi agents killed the 59-year-old writer within two hours of his arrival at the consulate and then cut up his body with a bone saw they had brought specifically for this purpose. What are the public's thoughts? A world where a journalist is murdered in an embassy for telling a story, that's not a world I want to be in. If Western countries really hold democracy dear, they should be acting with the same severity as they would act with as if Iran had done it or as if any other country that is not a friend or a commercial partner would have done it. So I think the response should have been far stronger than it has been. It's an ideological assassination. It's making a statement because they feel very much under threat. I think uh, the UK politicians are doing all the lip service, but I don't think the response has been strong enough. I think that it should kind of be a huge wake-up call for the entire world to say, you know, that's not okay what Saudi did, and um, to take it very seriously that press freedom should be allowed. Well, it's clear that, well, I think it's clear that the Saudis must have assassinated him, they've taken him hostage and whatnot. Um, Trump came out and said that there could have been rogue killers around the embassy. I think that's pretty laughable, seeing as a couple of days before he said that... Um, a couple of days before, he said that the Saudis might have done it. They'd said that he'd left by a different exit. And immediately my thought was, yeah, he'd left maybe, you know, in bits uh, in a diplomatic bag. Who knows um, if that, but whatever the case, I mean, it's, it, there is no place for this in, in today's world and in the world of diplomacy. Free speech, whatever that might mean, relies upon a balanced argument. It relies upon dialogue. And so... How can you hope to maintain any sort of fairness or democracy without kind of representation of both sides, even if both sides are kind of skewed one way or the other? Let's face it, this is not really something so far away from everything else they do. I mean, this is a country that uh, Save the Children Fund is saying that in the next year is going to be the cause of one million children dying in Yemen. You know, they're killing people on a daily basis. Inside Saudi Arabia, they're behaving exactly like that. So they take anybody, including princes, and, 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 and locking them up to extract money out of them. And uh, it really is an oppressive system, which is somehow probably is difficult for us to even imagine living in the West, you know, sitting anywhere in the world you know, to see and to think there is a society that exists on that level of uh, oppression is very difficult to imagine. But that is what is happening. The fact that they think they could do and this sort of thing and get away with it, it really is shocking. And it sort of uh, tells of the reality that they have been given uh, sort of ability to do this by United States, by their supporters like uh, Israelis and everything else. And they deliberately has done this to actually create fear so no one will even sort of challenge them. And let's see, this challenge wasn't total challenge. This is a Saudi supporter, but is basically just criticizing the prince. They can't even stomach that. It is evil to imagine that this diplomatic premises had been used to commit one of the most heinous crimes. Uh, denying somebody, a human being, of the right to live. Even, uh, even if it is in, uh, in a mild way, is, uh, is, is horrible. Let alone if it is carried out in a vicious way, uh, using chainsaw, using hacks, cutting the person into pieces. This is not acceptable to be done with an animal. Even the animal has rights, let alone the human soul that God has honored and glorified. So what the Saudis did in their embassy in, in Istanbul is unimaginable, beyond uh, imagination uh, and the human taste. It's just out of total disregard 
to morality and the human value and the human rights. What, if anything, can be done to stop the Saudi government from violating human rights and assassinating journalists? And I don't think the politicians, I don't think anyone really knows how to answer that. Economic sanctions and severe, severe strong reaction. I'm not in favor of the idea of intervening in other governments or interference with other countries' sovereignty, but I think in the case of Saudi Arabia, it's very blatant the extent of how, how friendly relations have been developed. Unless we stop trading with them, unless uh, we, we stop being complicit with Saudi Arabia as, um, as a nation state, major violator of human rights, um, then probably not very much. It's just going to remain. I feel like the part that we can play is maybe to stop aiding them in that respect. I think the biggest thing would just be like for Western powers to stop investing so much money um, and also for the media to kind of stop appraising um, MBS for being, you know, this amazing individual that's going to change Saudi because clearly nothing's being changed. I don't know if this encompasses that, but, you know, a lot of people around, a lot of students have a problem with Saudi, with the um, British and American um, lines to the Saudi government in terms of the, uh, the massive arms deals that, you know, I mean, they might be used on Yemeni kids and whatnot. What must be stopped? I, I honestly don't know what the solution is. Uh, the international community clearly has got to join forces and make known, which I mean, in some of them have already uh, done that, but um, whether the Saudi government will take any notice or the Saudi royal family will take any notice, that's another matter. You can't come in from the outside to change things because you are by nature an outsider and I think that will only ever bring about more problems so I don't I don't know you have to incite change from within well I really think that this goes far 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 beyond human rights I mean this is you know is, is like saying what can we do uh, to uh, Nazi Germany so they will implement human rights well you know they're not going to do it I mean uh, you know they're not it's not an issue that uh, Everything else is right. There is a due process, there is a legal system, there is a, a structure of empowering people and it needs to be treated so they will actually provide human rights. No, the whole thing is uh, really rotten to the core and we need to actually change it. But the international community and United States and others don't want to change it because like the, during the Shah time in Iran, what they want is individuals or a royal family to do their bidding and uh, as long as they're doing their bidding they could actually get away with murder and there is no future um, of, of reforming this sort of a structure. This sort of a structure needs to be dismantled and the power given to people. Well, I do not believe they can be uh, banned from doing it. They are doing it. They may not do it. You may stop them doing it in their embassies but they are doing it in their torture chambers. Didn't they do it uh, to Sheikh number, number three, four years ago? Didn't they uh, chop the heads of uh, underaged boys and women? This is the same thing in Bahrain, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia. These uh, vicious dictators have no limit in the cruelty they are capable of undertaking and doing. So uh, the only way to uh, really stop them is to really undertake to, to uh, a regime change. You cannot democratize a dictator. You cannot moralize an immoral, uh, savage uh, ruler. So I believe that it is time for, the, for our region, for Bahrain, for Saudi Arabia, to have a regime change. That's the only way where uh, we can uh, run and live in our societies in peace, tranquility, and love. The alternative is to continue this vicious circle of violence, especially by the regimes against their uh, opponents. In this tightly controlled media environment, where much cannot be said, Saudis now seek uncensored news and entertainment in other ways, for example through satellite dishes. Even though technically it is illegal to own a satellite dish in the country, the skyline of every city is dotted with them on people's rooftops. Also, eventually, after two weeks of pressure, Saudi officials finally admitted that Jamal Khashoggi had indeed died just hours after he arrived at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul.
This leaves Riyadh with a public relations disaster that has materially harmed its relations with many other countries, politically and economically. The Turkish President Erdogan has called on the Saudi consulate in Istanbul to prove Khashoggi actually left the consulate alive. As we prepared this programme, Saudi Arabia had still failed to do so. Jamal Khashoggi may still show up and prove the accusers wrong. But with every day that passes, more and more people do accuse Saudi Arabia of presiding over a state which is controlling the media, denying freedom of speech and quite possibly murdering journalists.